myself, Dr. Anuj Gaba. I'm your faculty for clinical anatomy, and this is the workbook that is being specially designed for the next and the FMG students. So you're watching this lecture right now on the Rare Education e-learning platform, and uh, if you have any doubts, make sure to visit and let me know. So in this is the second chapter of the anatomy series. So this is the introduction chapter is over the basic terminology in general anatomy. And now we're studying about the histology. So let us start without any further ado. So in chapter two histology, we have to understand first that histology is what? Why do we need to study histology? So first of all, before understanding that, we have to understand that what is basically the instrument that we use for studying histology so the basic instrument that we use for studying histology it's microscope we all have used it during our 10th 11th 12th and even during our first year if we went to the anatomy and histology lab or pathology lab or microbiology lab we all have used microscope now we all know what is a microscope but why do we need to use it like we can still see a specimen on the slide but why do i need to use it any idea? So, microscope is basically an instrument that we use to see that small object or the details of that small object that which cannot be seen by the unaided eyes. Now look at this slide. On this slide, I think some of you only can see that the specimen is here. Look at that. Here is the specimen. Now, with your naked eye, I don't even think you can see the specimen or you cannot even see what is there in the specimen. But when I see that under the microscope, look at that, looks very beautiful. I can see different layers, I can see different cells. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think is this specimen of? Is this of the brain? Is this of the kidney? Is this of the liver? Is this of the spleen? Is this of the lung? Or none of these? So if you are smart enough and if you're good enough with your pre-med, I'm damn sure you said none of the above. Because this is a plant specimen. It is not a human specimen. I'm sorry if you answered something else, but the answer is that the, I will tell the truth. So, it's a plant specimen. So, even anything, I am saying that even this fine granules of sand can be studied, which are not studied by us, but by metallurgy students. But you have to understand that we use microscope to see the details, which we cannot see with our naked eyes or with unaided human eyes. So, now... You have to understand that the function of a microscope is to improve or to magnify the object. Now, it magnifies by using magnifying lens that are there in the in front of the microscope. The different kind of powers that it have. It has 10x, 100x, 200x, oil immersion, different types. Depends on which kind of microscope you are using. How much money you will put in the microscope. Now, if you see that if you go to Amazon or Flipkart and if you want to buy a microscope for your table, you can buy starting from at least 1000 bucks. That's all. 1000 is the price of the cheapest one. But what you will be able to see under that, that is nothing. Because again, the lens is going to be just 1 to 2x to 3x to 5x. Now, if you see the microscopes that we use in the hospitals or in the laboratories, they are expensive. 5 to 10 lakhs, 16 to 30 lakhs, depending on the brand and the size. So, microscopes are of different types. So, again, you don't need to purchase. You don't need to purchase your own microscope. But again, if you ever go into microbiology, pathology, clinical pathology or laboratories, you will see that a lot of uh, doctors, they like to have their own personal microscope because, again, different reasons are there. Different preferences are there. So, microscopes are are an eternal part like how for a clinician stethoscope is a very internal part for a ophthalmologist the retinoscope and for a ENT person an otoscope is a very very required part like that only for a pathologist a histology person or for a clinical path or lab person the microscope is the most unseparable part for him or her now microscopes we use them but not really in the hospital settings that is not used by the clinicians. There are different set of people who are called microbiologists who use it, but not us. So 
but still we need to know what a microscope is and how it works because again as a doctor you have to know everything so microscopes can be of different types so if you see this microscope you will see that this is a light microscope now what do i mean by light i don't mean ki ye halka hai to isliye ye light microscope hai please light means it is a microscope that uses light as illumination illumination matlab roshni and light matlab light so it uses light as a source of illumination it can be an artificial light or it can be a sunlight that is a natural light now if you see this the cheap microscopes that we used to use in our schools back i don't even remember 7 8 years 10 years back they were used to have a reflecting mirror down instead of having a illumination source that is a power power up light with the help of a socket they used to have a mirror you have to sit outside the mirror will the the light will reflect on the mirror you have to adjust the mirror put it on the desk and then you can see it so that is a very cheap kind of microscope but again it is still a light microscope now if you see the microscopes that we use in the labs again because the labs are all closed for obvious reasons they use the light microscope that is using artificial light as a source of light so again light microscopes simple microscopes are there which are used which are mostly monocular and have one or two lenses that you can change for seeing the specimen this one is a special image that i wanted to show all of you you will see that again in your microbiology classes by the doctor who is going to teach you or maybe me microbiology you would know that there are different organisms that can be seen by different methods some can be seen in the blood some can be seen in the saliva some can be seen in the tissue some can be seen with the stains or some can be we seen without the stains so treponema pallidum remember that name it is an expected question treponema pallidum is the causative organism for syphilis and it can only and only be seen during dark field microscopy now what is dark field microscopy see this image can you see something different in this image the background is all dark and the organism is all white how is this happening let me show you a normal image normally a image looks like this the background is white and the cells are colored but here something different is happening the background is all dark but the cell has the color now how is that happening this is called dark field microscopy the special kind of a light microscopy that we use in the labs for special organisms now take a second look at the diagram again try and absorb what i am trying to tell that the specimen itself is illuminated but the background is dark like this one if you see this is done by using a special stain it is called india ink stain so you will study that again in microbiology i don't want to overload you with the terms and the stains right now but please understand that microscopes can do magics so like this one and this you will see later in the next slide that microscope has a part called as condenser so in this we use a special kind of condenser in dark field microscopy which is basically reflecting the light from the specimen at a specific angle and that thing is making the specimen illuminate and the background remain dark so i this is again physics you don't need to go into the basics like how is it happening kyu ho raha hai kaise ho raha hai at least remember this much ki ho raha hai aur wo kya ho raha hai ki the condenser is reflecting the light at such a specific angle on the organism that the organism gets illuminated but the background remains dark so there are two samples that we use it but the most common that is asked to all of you is going to be the treponema pallidum that causes syphilis in the human beings the next one which is very important for a lot of us and a lot of us have used it in in our first year mbbs that is a compound microscope so compound microscope is also a light microscope why i called it compound because you have to understand that the simple microscope will only have one lens not even two compound microscope will have multiple lens like a 10x 100x in a oil immersion so you can rotate and you can see different resolutions different magnifications different details that you want to see now compound light microscope is also 
like a simple microscope again uses a light source it can be a artificial or it can be a natural light mostly it is artificial light because we need more intensity then in compound microscope mostly it is a two lens to three lens system what do i mean by two to three lens that means how many lens are there on the on the stage that can rotate that you can see at one at a time so two to three lens system and then each lens has a different magnifying power obviously it has to have a different magnifying power because if it has same magnifying power what is the use of putting two lenses of the same power that is why as nominal guideline it is 10x 100x and oil immersion for a three lens system for a two lens system it is always 100x and 10x so please next time when you see the microscope please see these things in this diagram you can see it is very well labeled what are the parts don't worry it is in the next slide as well we'll show you that later so here you can again see that there are different kinds of microscopes so if you see this one very clearly this image you will see that there is only one eyepiece that i have to put my eye one close and with one i can see but if you see the other microscope that i'm going to show you it is a binocular it has two eyepiece look at that again it is also a compound microscope it is a three magnifying four magnifying glass system but again a compound microscope but look at this one it is only a two magnifying lens system and a monocular so sometimes these things can confuse us in the exam if we are not really knowing these terms so that is why i am trying to tell these terms to you so that you do not really panic during the exam exam is not difficult it becomes difficult when we do not know what to do aata sab kuch sabko hai but us time pe yaad aana very important hai so let us see the next kind of microscope it is called a electron microscope we have already seen this a lot of times in movies especially agar aap uh, dc marvel types movies dekhoge there are different technologies that they show electron microscope is a technology that was used to be a fiction but now is a reality when i was studying pre med i don't think maybe there were only two electron microscope in the whole india now i don't even know the number so electron microscopes are basically a very 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 high power microscope that can give you a very 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 high resolution on the specimen now look at that look at this diagram it is like a tunnel you see that it is not looking like a microscope at all ye to kuch computer jaisa lag raha hai because actually it is not a microscope it is something like a computer that mechanics and electrical engineer they have compiled and made something wonderful that is now helping us treat the patients so basically in an electron microscope we do not really use a beam of light we are not using a source of light like artificial light or sunlight or yellow bulb light or white bulb light no we are rather using electrons can you understand the the minority that it is using electron can you remember your 10th 11th 12th class electron proton neutron so it is using electron it is throwing electron at the specimen and instead of using glass lenses that we use in the in the simple and the compound microscope here it is using electromagnets that are doing their work and making the movement in the electron so there is a emitter and then there is an absorber and in between somewhere there is the specimen plate it is there the electron passes through the specimen and then it is being absorbed by the plate and then we see that image so now if you see very closely you might remember that when you studied microbiology you see that those pictures of those viruses that we see like this is a asteroid shape this is a noodle shape this is a a uh, rock shape or brick shape what not those all are being observed by the microbiologist using the mic electron microscope because my because viruses cannot be seen using any other microscope you have to understand that that i cannot see a mic i cannot see a virus using a simple or a compound microscope even if i am using 100x lens i still cannot see it because virus again are what they are not even surviving as a being outside your cell they need your cell so again when you will study microbiology maybe if i teach or someone else is teaching you will see that there are different methods of culturing viruses as well we have to provide them some media that is made up of alive things 
like the alive blood agar or other agars that we give them so that they grow in that and then we can see them it is not easy job and just to give you another heads up because if you are curious about electron microscope a lot as i was when i was your age electron microscopes we really do not use that glass slide that we put on a normal microscope electron microscope we use the slide that is made up of metal special kind of metals are there that is alloys and it is even thinner than my nail and we keep the specimen on that so just imagine the size is so less and the image is so big so again a beautiful work of mechanical electrical engineering that they have used and help us to help the patients so now discussing about the parts of microscope i am telling you very bluntly not all of them are asked the most important are asked and i am telling you the most important one right now so let us start from the beginning eye piece if you see here this is a binocular because it has two eye piece then there is a microscope tube that is after the eye piece and before the objective now then there is a arm that we use to hold the microscope then there is a stage that is there on the microscope where we place the slide then there is stage holders that are used that are like a clip that we put on the slide then there are two kind of focus one is a coarse focus and one is a fine focus so focus the coarse focus is for big changes fine focus is for the minute changes so if you have used a microscope you already know what i mean by that like if you want to go 5 to 10 levels up or down you use coarse focus but if you just want to go 1 or 2 or 0.5 or 0.3 up or down you use fine focus to change that that crispness of seeing what you are seeing then there is a condenser if you see here condenser as i mentioned in the dark field microscopy is a very important part then there is a iris diaphragm and a illuminator so illuminator is the one that produces the with that produces the light that is going iris diaphragm is the one that is checking or determining how much light is passed through and condenser at last is the one that is condensing it now it can be using as as a specialized condenser and then it can become a dark field microscope a lot of things are there do not worry it is not asked at your level so at your level it is only asked to label these so please take a picture take a screenshot or google please remember the image and the label of the microscope different kind of microscope binocular microscope electron microscope monocular compound microscope dark field microscopy and simple microscope so please understand these things now who is the i have discussed so much about microscope now who is the father of microscope who discovered microscope who used it for the first time in the whole world the answer is antony van leeuwenhoek do not forget that the man who designed the first microscope now you might be thinking what was his first specimen was he using skin buccal mucosa urine etc answer is none of them he used pond water that means the talab ka pani so he used that or a different kind of algae fungi uh, amoeba etc he saw them and he was amazed that is called microscope now and he is the father of microscope microscopy as well and antony van leeuwenhoek is his name but if you remember robert hook in class 10th biology book his name is still in right he is the person who coined the term called as cells So, if you see his history, Robert Hooke used the cork that is there on the top of the wine bottles nowadays. He took a slice of that and he saw that under the microscope, and he could see something like this. Compartments are there, so he named them as cell. So he was the first person who coined the term cells, whereas Antony van Leeuwenhoek was the first person to to find or to to invent microscope. Understand that now. staining different stains are used staining is basically an artificial coloration or i can say a color that we add from outside to see the tissue or the cells now there are different kind of stains like zein nielsen stain india ink stain gram stain then there are uh, lactophenol uh, stain jimsa stain lugol's iodine tricom stain then mason's trichome there are there is periodic acid shift there is congo red different stains for different things now do we really need to remember all of them the sad answer is yes
so i have given this beautiful diagram here maybe you can take a screenshot and zoom in so like if you see for amyloid we use congo red stain for carbohydrates we can use alcyon blue or pas pas means periodic acid shift stain for neuronal tissues we basically use the most common that is uses luxol fast blue for triglyceride and lipids very easy to remember oil red o or the congo red then for reticulin fibers we use reticulin stain itself then for connective tissue there are different stains the most important among them is meson trichome then for pigments there are different stains like one cosa stain then for prussian blue for iron then uh, for one cause i have already mentioned then for different microorganisms as well we have different stains like acid fast bacteria we use quinone stain or acid fast bacteria we use two stains basically quinone and as well as the zeal nansen or the zeren stain that we call normally then there is oramine o there is different stains that we use for fungi you don't need to remember that there is warthin starry stain and gram stain again you will learn them in pathology and microbiology more than histology so i have just given you an heads up that what stains are there look at these stains in this diagram you will see that there are different things that you can see like zeal nielsen stain how to remember that that you can see the clouds of blue and then you can see them some things in between so these are the tuberculosis bacteria so these are the zeal nielsen stain then india ink preparation as i mentioned before in the beginning of the class this is the one that we use for dark field microscopy then you can see that this is the strip why i know this is strip because i can see that there are straight lines okay now you can see trichome stain here giardia lambia this is giardia lambia so lugol's iodine that is used for staining what for staining starch and for other substances as well for pap smear and many other things i am just giving you a heads up that there are different stains that we remember for different things and we remember and we forget so my advice humble advice to all of you for histology for pathology for microbiology and for clinical subjects make a list of the stains that are mentioned in all the different subjects and the list of the subjects that they are staining like uh, periodic acid shift for carbohydrate zeal nielsen stain and quinone stain for acid fast bacteria so remember them like this and remember them every day for at least 1 minute 2 minutes and it will be there in your mind forever now stains used in histopath as i already showed you this diagram before here is just a list for you to remember there are different stains like hematoxylin and eosin stain gemsa stain congo red stain periodic acid shift asian blue sudan red mason trichome and acridine orange these are the most important that i could remember with my brain there are many more i'm saying there are more than 30 to 40 stains that are there in different subjects so make a list so you can remember them properly now the most important stain that we have to remember for histology subject is hematoxylin and eosin stain so hematoxylin stain is basically a basic dye what do i mean by basic dye it is a alkaline dye it is basically alkaline in nature that is ph is more than 7 now it is if pH is more than seven, it is a basic dye. What will it stain? It will stain the opposite one. So it will stain acidic things. And the most acidic thing of the whole human cell is nucleus. What is nucleus made up of? DNA, RNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, ribonucleic acid. It is acid. So it will be stained by hematoxylin. What color hematoxylin will give? It will give the blue color. Look at this. The nucleus is mostly blue in color. Can you see that? Now, if you see that this diagram, can you see and can you tell me what is the mother site of this of this specimen? We have three option, four options. Is it brain? Is it liver? Is it kidney? Is it spleen? Is it the intestine, or is it not a human sample? So, again, I know it is little brutal to you to ask these things, but again, if you are a little bit imaginative, you can answer within one second. So the answer to this is the it is the sample from your kidney. How do I know that? Look at these globules. Can you see these globules? What are these? These are the glomerulus. After these, can you see these white things? What are these? These are your DCT, the PCT, the loop of Henle, the collecting duct. They are there. Transfer section is there. So this is again very basic thing that you should remember. And just as an extra information, these hematoxylin stains are used for demonstration of cell nuclei. as well as for myelin 
so myelin hyaline there are different kinds of materials that are there in the human body so just remember if you can remember myelin elastic fibers fibrin muscle striations and other substances and the oxidative product of hematin is the active staining component so hematoxylin as a component that is the oxidative product of that hematoxylin it is called hematin basically that is the staining component it was asked only one time that is also in neat pg and not ever asked in fmge but i just kept it here if they can ask so I, you should know now eosin eosin is the counterpart so hematoxylin is the basic dye that stains the acid eosin is the acidic dye that stains the basic parts what are the basic parts so basic parts of the body are the cytoplasm because nucleus is acidic so everything else is going to be basic just as a comparison so it will make it all pink so can you see that this slide has a lot of pink these are all the cytoplasm of the cells and the blue dots that you can see in between and a lot of them here it is basically the nucleus now if you can tell me or you can guess what is this site of specimen so options again are liver muscle brain kidney spleen not a human so if you are good enough and you can imagine you can see that you can see some striations that are going that are traveling that are traveling like a river so the answer to this is muscle it is a muscle sample so please get a little bit of imagination you can understand that medicine is not just about remembering paracetamol and aspirin and ecosprin and labetalol or diphenhydramine it is way more than that you have to understand because a patient will not come to you for a subject he will not be like, oh, oh ask the doctor of anatomy, parke him, anatomy him. I will just ask him anatomy because he's studying anatomy. It doesn't work like that. When you're sitting in an OPD or IPD, a patient can be anyone for any disease. So please. Now, going a little bit more deep and a little bit superficial at the same time. Uh, histology is basically about taking samples. That samples can be taken superficially or from inside. So if I'm taking it superficially, I can do it by fine needle aspiration biopsy. I can do it by fine needle aspiration cytology. I can use scraping. And if I'm taking it from inside, I can do endoscopy. So there are different kinds of endoscopies that we can use. So again, electroscope, sigmoendoscope, there are different kinds of endoscopes that we use for taking samples and for different procedures of different parts of body. And then we take a sample and then we assess that in the body, uh, in the lab. So again, basic one that we use always is skin. So if you see that the skin can be of two types, if you have a skin like this, you are very blessed. You have a skin like a Korean, but if your skin looks like this, again, you are not cursed. It is just a situation that is there in your skin. It is called acne vulgaris, which you study more in detail and very much more detail in dermatology. I'm just here to tell you that be thankful if you have a normal thing. Do not just be jealous. Oh, I'm a kala, I'm a gora. If you have a normal skin, good enough. If you do not have a normal skin, still go to a dermatologist. We can help you. So do not worry. Now, there are different layers of skin. So you have to understand that there are different layers of skin like epidermis, dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Now, epidermis itself has different layers. So different layers are stratum, conium, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum and basale. Now, these are from top to bottom. And how do you remember them? So for remembering them, there is a mnemonic. But you have to remember the mnemonic is come, let's get some burger. Ao burger lene chalte hain. So, corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, basil. You will never ever forget them in your whole life. And you have to really remember it in this sequence. Because they might ask you to sequence. Sometimes the question is very easy. So, please remember that. Then, dermis has two types papillary and reticular. Papillary is the finger like projections, and the reticular is, is what under the papillary is. Then the skin has sweat ducts, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, nails, hair, and whatnot. So those are called appendages of the nail that are seen somewhere here. We will see that in the next slide, do not worry. Then there are blood capillaries that are there and the nerve endings that are there to provide nerve sensation and the blood supply and the food supply to the skin because the skin itself is really living if you cut someone's skin the blood comes out and you can feel what is being written on your skin if i just write something so skin is still alive it is the biggest organ of the body please take care of it use some spf use some creams to help you for nutrition and nourishment of your skin 
we take a lot of nourishment for food but now the food is not good enough and doesn't have a lot of things that are really required so feel free to go to your dermatology uh, doctor and he can prescribe you some good things so then vein and artery basics and then the deepest layer is called the subcutaneous fatty tissue now if you see the appendages of the skin i was always mentioning in the last slide or the previous slide is that it is nail hair sweat gland and sebaceous gland so nail as we can see here the nails can be of see beautiful nail pediatry uh, uh, manicure pedicure is done and the nail is being painted very very beautifully with different nail paints and nail polish and nail design look at this it is also a nail but again it doesn't look normal doesn't look beautiful doesn't look fine so this situation is called pterygium a lot of you might have just studied pterygium in the eye but this is also a pterygium so please if you have this again do not worry these are all dermatological conditions you can always study that in dermatology i'm just here to show you comparison between normal and abnormal because in dermatology you will just study the abnormal wahan normal nahi padhayenge normal to yahan padhna hai na to please keep your ears open your eyes open and study make notes because again you don't know what can be asked here look at this beautiful girl maybe studied in armenia georgia huh? kazakhstan went to the salon got the keratin done the highlight done the blonde and everything but not look at this girl going through hair fall alopecia areata alopecia universalis she is not having any hair left on the head she is having patches of hairlessness so again different conditions are there you study them detail in dermat sweat gland and sebaceous gland very very confusing topic for a lot of my students so just let me make it very clear to all of you if you ever see a specimen in your whole life if it is a histological specimen and you see a gland that is near the hair follicle that gland or the hair base is there that gland is sebaceous gland sweat glands are not near the hair follicle they are there but not near the hair follicle what do i mean by that look at this this is the hair this is the hair follicle and see the sebaceous gland is just along with the shaft because sebum is is secreted near the hair wherever the hair pores are there that is why the hair nourishment is there normally whereas sweat glands they open directly on the skin sweat glands are responsible for the thermodynamic maintenance of the body thermic thermodynamic maintenance of the body for the what do we mean by that like zara garmi hai to sweat happens and we cool down when it is how when it is cold we shiver and we we produce heat and that's how the thermodynamic is working in the body but sweat glands are not really opening near the hair near the hair sebaceous glands are opening which are producing sebum now sebum is like a fluid that we all a lot of us when we put finger on our on our face or our head we can see that it is not sweat it is some kind of oil so that oil that human body oil is sebum so that sebum is produced from sebaceous gland there is sweat we all can see that sweat is a sweat it is water and salts whereas sebum is oil it is fat so please understand the difference between both of them now types of epithelium basic but very important again questions have not been asked on this topic for the past 3 exams so it is very expected that they might ask you this time so please take a screenshot take time remember them properly do not be in a hurry because a lot of students they just skip this part and then when they see these things in the exam they are like ab kya kare there is no help look at this first diagram simple squamous look at this beautiful lumen this is a lumen and in this lumen can you see the nuclei the nuclei are flattened like chapati like a parantha look at that it is flattened so there is a simple squamous epithelium on the other hand look at this it is also a lumen but in this the nuclei are big like a puri or a batura like a idli they are not flattened they are big we can see them so it is simple cuboidal and the cells are like a cube and in that i can see the nuclei very prominently so it is simple cuboidal now look at this one here also i can see the nuclei very clearly but in this the cell are not cuboidal they are columnar they are column like they are like a rectangle and then in this i can see something that is there on the top like a hair like a fur so it is basically cilia now 
it is very difficult to differentiate between a cilia and a microvilli with a naked eye we can only differentiate with the movement and uh, with electron microscopy by seeing the base but again it is not going to be asked at your level but you have to just remember that how do you differentiate between simple squamous simple cuboidal and simple columnar that can be asked so you have to really have an eye to differentiate between the cell if it is a squamous squamous kinder i already gave you a hint the nucleus will be pitch cow it will be flattened in cuboidal nucleus will be big but the cell will be like a cube it will be like a square in columnar the nucleus will also be all prominent but the cell will be like a rectangle now on the top of it it can have a cilia or it can have a cube or it can have a microvilli cilia are usually very long because cilia have to do movement like a uh, movement of a what to say like a like a feather and a microvilli are like the bristles of your hair of your brush of your toothbrush so they are very small and minute and not even seen properly in the images so do not worry they will not really ask you to differentiate between a micro scopic picture of simple columnar with cilia and simple columnar with microvilli so do not worry but just remember how to differentiate now for stratified you have to understand that there are two types it can be keratinized or it can be non keratinized so what is keratin keratin is not what you get done in your hair in the spa no no that is different thing keratin is basically the layers of dead cells dead keratin is dead so whenever i do like this and something fails on my laptop screen or on my table those are dead cells did you feel pain while doing that the answer is no something is falling off that means that there something is getting a detached and falling off so that is maybe a keratin layer dead cells maybe some bacteria with it so understand that that stratified squamous keratinized is mostly everywhere on your skin but stratified squamous non keratinized is only at very specific locations you will study that later in the pathology part not here because if i will go in details the lecture will become 2 hours that what is where right now i'm here to make you understand how to see them because in pathology you will not see these images you will remember the lists here you have to see the image you have to remember how it looks idhar shakal yaad karni hai udhar jagah yaad karni hai there is a difference you have to remember the face here that there you have to remember the location so look here can you see this pink color wavy wavy thing on the top this is the keratin layer can you see that here the answer is no there is no keratin here there only i can see the topmost layer that is stratum corneum there is no more keratin layer above that so it is stratified squamous non keratinized whereas this one is stratified squamous keratinized now there are different kind of specialized epithelium as well so look at this one can you see this one you think that there are different layers see 1 2 3 1 2 3 1 2 but if you see very closely you can trace that the cell is getting thin then big then thin then big this cell is big thin big this cell is getting big thin finished this cell is getting thin then getting a nucleus and then going up so basically it is only one cell but the cell is in a different shape nucleus is also one cell is also one so there is different cells are different which are differently arranged so you think that there are different layers of the cells but in reality it is just one layer of cell it is that's why called pseudo stratified jhootha jhootha means which is not real so you think that it is a stratified that means there is stratification that means that there is layering but the answer is in reality there is no layering there is only one cell at a time the nucleus only is placed up or down or side by side that is why you think that is oh it is a layer it is not layer it is simple but it looks like a layer that is why we named it like a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar coi columnar because the cells are like a column ciliated because we can see the cilia and pseudo stratified because i thought that it is layers but it is not layers it is simple so that is what is called pseudo stratified now look at this one very famous and i expected question for all of you that what is this now if you see this cell i can see different cells different sizes and different shape if you see the cells at the top they look like a umbrella look at this 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 beautiful so these cells they look like an umbrella they are called umbrella cell as well as called facet cell 
and this is called a transition epithelium also called as a urothelium because it is only and only found in urinary bladder so it increase in size when you are collecting urine in your urinary bladder and decrease back to the size after you pass urine that is called micturition so please do not confuse look at the images again grasp them with your eyes see how the nucleus look how the cells look because in the real exam these labelings might not be there so please get used to of remembering them without the labeling also now look at here cartilage a connective tissue that we have we discussed in part 1 chapter 1 do not forget that repeat the chapter 1 once again after chapter 2 so that you are in a continuity because after this the next chapter it is going to be a logarithmic curve you will be like oh everything happened too fast so please repeat the chapters see them again and again and again and again so that the concept is very clear to you now if you see this image you will see that there are different cartilages are there hyaline cartilage elastic cartilage and fibrocartilage hyaline cartilage is basically the cartilage that is the called clear crystal cartilage it is crystal clear see there is very less cells it is crystal clear it is white almost it is hyaline hyaline means crystal clear it is found only one place mostly it is called trachea elastic cartilage now the trick for elastic cartilage that elastic cartilage is always at the e epiglottis ear pinna and eustachian tube look at this no one will ask you to to really identify them separately it might be given as a image along with your question so do not worry but i'm just showing you and i'm telling you the location because it has been a pyq already so look at that because elastic cartilage now the stains are hematoxylin and eosin and it is mostly blue so that means that elastic cartilage had an acid that is why it was being stained by a basic stain so hematoxylin is more there and look at this one fibrocartilage so intervertebral disc is the location and look at this there are different fibers that you can see can you see that fiber and then you can see the cells so fibrocartilage is present in the intervertebral disc so it is the most sturdy elastic cartilage is elastic and hyaline cartilage is a clear one so these are the basic cartilages and these are the basic images that i tried to show you in today's class if you have any doubts please let me know do not really just 2x and remember these you really have to grasp the image because it is your first time seeing these images probably remember the stains remember the location try and imagine the sites of the these samples study about them in google and if you have any more doubts make sure to comment reach out to me and i am more than happy to help you all thank you so much